Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, yes, I just recently moved in um, with my boyfriend who has two cats. Um, so now we are a family of five cats. Um, he has a sweet cat named Blue and a cat named Mama. Uh, Mama actually came from my hospital. Uh, he adopted her from me. Um, she, she was like not even a year old with three kittens bigger than her. Um, and so we g gave her a home and she's one of the sweetest little girls. Um, so, um, you know, like was said, you know, I am a veterinarian. I've been practicing for about three years now. Um, I went to USC. I was an exercise science major. Um, it took me five years to graduate because about halfway through, I decided or realized that, yes, veterinary medicine is my passion. It is something that I can do. Um, you know, how the Africa, you know, kind of comes in, you know, I was there um, working with baby baboons. I found it kind of online and I loved monkeys and I thought it was such a cool idea. Um, so I went down there and I had this experience um, that, that, that made me realize that veterinary medicine and this is something that I could do because I always, you know, thought I wanted to do it, grew up like every other kid, oh, that's something I want to do, but realized as I got older that one of the jobs of a veterinarian is euthanasia. And I was like, ah, there's no way I could ever do that. I love animals too much. So I was in Africa one summer and this uh, female adult baboon was a little sick and she fell in her enclosure and hit her head on a rock and was very, very sick. And they brought her into the clinic and had uh, volunteers every hour trying to feed her, trying to get her to eat something, trying to get her to get some life in her. She was curled up in the back of her cage next to a radiator heater. Um, and she, I was looking at her, trying to feed her this bottle, talking to her, you know, begging her to, to drink something. And I could see it in her eyes that she had just given up, you know, that she didn't want to be here anymore, that she was suffering and, and she was done. And at that moment, I, I knew I, I could help this animal. You know, this is something that I, I could do. So um, long story short, I kind of changed my track. I kept my major, um, but I added a bunch of different biology classes and prerequisites that I needed for veterinary school. And I applied to vet school. Um, during my last semester of school um, at USC um, for exercise science, we had to do like an externship for the semester. And I did it at a veterinary practice in town. Um, once I finished that externship, the doctor actually um, offered me a technician position um, and while I was applying to vet school and until I got into vet school. So I uh, worked as a technician for about nine months um, until I was accepted to Ross University, which is in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, that's in the Caribbean, if you don't know. So yes, terrible, terrible life that I live. Um, it actually sounds a lot better than it was. It was a lot of days looking out the window saying that beach looks really nice and sitting there with a bunch of books and studying. Um, but there were times, of course, uh, to get out and enjoy the beach. Um, so then um, at Ross, what you do, you do three years of clinical, of, of coursework, I mean, sorry, um, where you sit in a classroom and you, you learn all the things that you need to know. And we don't just learn about one species of animals. We learn cats, dogs, horses, pigs, cows, chickens, guinea pigs, rats, you know, everything. They even throw in a little bit of information about humans too. So we really do have to learn it all. So we do three years of that. We also do some laboratory work and some skills work, some like learning how to place catheters, draw blood, things like that to suture. Um, then what we do from there is we do a year of clinical work. Um, if you go to a state st school, you're gonna spend all four years at that state school. Um, however, Ross University, being on such a tiny little Caribbean island, we don't have a veterinary teaching hospital. So we have to come to the states to do our clinical year. So I went to LSU, Louisiana State, um, and did my year there. And what we do during that year is basically kind of like a rotating internship. So you spend a couple weeks on different um, services. So you'll spend a couple weeks on internal medicine, a couple weeks on surgery, large animal medicine, um, equine medicine, equine surgery, um, cardiology, ophthalmology, dermatology. So it's a very, very long comprehensive um, year of clinical work that really, really helps to prepare you for being a veterinarian. Um, so once I finished LSU, I came um, to my job. I'm actually back in Columbia and loving it and so happy to be back with um, the doctor that I did my, my externship and um, was a technician for. 
Um, she saved me this job. Um, she was actually working as a single doctor for an entire year waiting for me to finish veterinary school so that I could come to work for her. Um, so we're in a small two doctor practice in town. Um, it's really, really nice. You know, we, we kind of can practice how we want to. We have a lot of leeway that way. Um, we're not corporate, so we're not bound by certain, you know, rules and regulations based on, you know, your corporate practice. So we can help a lot of animals. We get to see a lot of animals daily. Um, and it's really, really a fun job. Now, some days are hard. Some days are harder than others, of course. But overall, it is a very fun and rewarding experience. Um, so to kind of get you to understand what the daily life of a veterinarian is like, I was going to kind of go through what my day was yesterday. Um, and I see that there is a little eight-year-old watching. Um, so I'm so happy you're here. And I hope that you um, want to be a veterinarian. And you'll love it. Um, but the first thing I'm going to talk about might be just a little difficult for you to hear, um, but it's, it's real life. Okay. Um, so how my day normally goes, um, my, my, the way that my schedule works is I come in at eight o'clock and from eight o'clock to nine o'clock, I see drop off appointments and I make phone calls, look at blood work and laboratory work from the day before, call owners with things like that. If you don't know what a drop-off appointment is, that basically is an opportunity for an owner to bring their animal, you know, before they go to work or before they go to run some errands for the day. And I can do what I need to do, spend enough time with that animal, especially if they're sick, it makes it easier for me to give me lots of time to give lots of care to that animal. And then they pick up, you know, when I call them and tell them that they're, they're ready to be picked up. Um, so I spend that first hour doing that. Then I spend the nine to 12 o'clock hour seeing appointments. If I'm lucky, I get to take a two hour lunch break. That's very, very rare. Um, we schedule that two hour lunch break so that we actually do end up with hopefully at least a few minutes to scarf down some food. Um, and then I see appointments again from two to five and from five to six, I again am making phone calls, doing discharges with all the owners of all the patients that I saw that day um, and doing any again, checking on blood work and things like that. Um, so, Yesterday, on this particular day, um, getting ready for work, and my receptionist calls me at 7.30, and she goes, hey, Dr. Callahan, I'm so sorry to call you so early, but um, I have a problem. And I'm like, okay, yeah, what's, what's happening? And she says, um, as soon as I pulled into the parking lot, there was already um, people waiting for me in the parking lot, and they have a cat that's, that's having trouble breathing. And I said, okay, not a problem. Okay, what I need you to do, go into the back and turn on the oxygen machine. Walked her through how to do that, and then I walked her through how to pull out the machine, turn it on, put a mask on the cat to give it some oxygen till I could get there. So I got there as soon as I possibly could, um, ran in, assessed the cat, um, couldn't get a temperature on the cat. The cat was very, very sick, was very, was having difficulty breathing, listened to the cat, was having a lot of noises in the lungs, crackles, wheezes. Um, so I immediately put in a catheter, an IV catheter, and I got, I had my technician when they got there, get me some x-rays. Um, so they're stabilizing the cat, they're getting the bag of fluids together, and I go in to take a look at the x-rays. And I realize that unfortunately this poor baby is in congestive heart failure. And there's unfortunately nothing I can do in this stage. Um, the, the heart is full of fluid all around the heart. And while I could maybe remove some of that fluid, it's just going to fill right back up. And the baby is, and this cat is having such a difficult time breathing. So I have to go out and speak with the owners and let them know that unfortunately, that there's nothing I can do for this baby and that the best thing would be humane euthanasia. And of course they're very upset, you know, that, you know this is the, their baby and you know, they, they love this cat and they want the best for this cat, but they don't want her to suffer. And they understand that she's suffering and that there's no way that we can fix what's happening. So they, they elect to humanely euthanize. So we, we, we do that process, they're crying, I'm consoling them. Um, after we, you know, we walk away, my technician, you know, stays with her, you know, so that she's never alone. And um, I walk out with the owners and, you know, they're, you're, they're at, basically they're asking me, did they make the right decision? Is what they just did okay? And I'm, I'm telling them, of course, this was the best thing for this cat. This is all you could have done for her. You gave her the best life you could have and you gave her the best send off that you could have. And you'll see her again one day and this is what's best for her. And she's happy and not suffering anymore. Um, so they left and um, I immediately had to turn around and run to a puppy appointment. I'm a few minutes behind now for um, some vaccines for boosters. Um, so I stand outside there to walk up to the door, compose myself, take a deep breath, put a nice big smile on my face, walk in and say, oh my goodness, look at this cute little baby. Aren't you the cutest thing that I've ever seen? And go on from there. So um, 
it starts off bad, but it can get better. I just want everyone to kind of understand that I don't just play with puppies and kittens all day. So from that puppy appointment, um, I go to this cat that we have that's had a broken leg for a few weeks. Um, went to the emergency room when it happened. They recommended surgery, but the owner just couldn't afford it. Um, so they splinted the, the cat and said, go to your regu regular veterinarian for rechecks. So we've been splint re splinting every week. And at week four, we took the x-ray to see, you know, how we were doing, what the progress was. And unfortunately, it just did not look well yesterday. The bones, instead of, you know, aligned properly, they were overlapping. So they weren't, um, you know, aligned. So there was malalignment there. Um, and so I called the orthopedic surgeon and I said, hey, you know, this is what's going on. You know, you saw the cat first, you know, what do you recommend? And he was like, of course, you know, surgery would have been best, but, you know, I completely understand. So let's keep splinting the cat for another couple of weeks. So I have to go talk to the owner, say, this is what's going on. This is the plan. She approves it. I go to take the splint off, but it's all nasty and gross from being in a splint for a long time. So I asked the owner, can I keep her for a little bit, wash the foot up, get it dried, and then we'll put the splint on. He's like, absolutely. Okay, so I put her in the back, go to my next appointment. Um, my next appointment's a nice and easy one. It's a wellness exam, um, just vaccine blood work exam, nice and easy. So once I get, get some time, I go back to my drop-offs. I have a bunch of drop-offs for today. So I have a dog that's having vomiting diarrhea. I have a cat that's having diarrhea because they changed the food. And I have a stray cat that, they that somebody found with a bad wound on the tail. Um, I also have two dogs that are here for their first heartworm treatment. So um, I look at my vomiting diarrhea dog first, realize, oh, she's going to be absolutely fine. She was also having some inappetence, offered her some food. She gobbled it up. Everything was good. Um, then that little kitten got a stool sample from the kitten, was assuming that most likely if you change the food too quickly, that it can cause some, some diarrhea. So made sure there were no intestinal parasites causing that. Get her some medicine for the diarrhea, good to go. Had to run to another appointment before I could get to the cat with the tail. Um, again, just some allergies, nothing too, too crazy, but um, finished that appointment up. Then I went back to the cat with the tail, got the cat out, did my exam, realized that this cat has a degloving injury, which basically means that the skin completely is missing from all the way around the tail at one part, um, and that it's going to need to be, unfortunately, I can't surgically repair it because there's no extra skin on the tail to put back together. So what I'm going to have to do is clean it up, debride it, um, and then put a bandage on it. Um, so I realize that that's what has to happen. So I have to get permission to sedate this cat, put the cat away, call the owner, have reception do that, um, while I go and, and do my heartworm treatments. So I do my two heartworm treatments. Um, then I pull back out this sweet kitty and sedate this cat, clean, clean it up. And then I do what's pretty cool um, is I put a bandage on the tail. And, and I, so let me back up. I clean, clean the wound. And then I, as I'm putting the bandage on, I put a layer of sugar on the wound and then wrap it in the bandage. The sugar actually helps the wound to heal faster. It's really, really cool. So this cat's going to come in every two days. I'm going to replace the bandage, going to put more, I'm going to rinse it off, put more sugar on it, put the bandage on until the skin heals itself. Um, it would have, it's going to happen much faster than, um, than if I just left it alone. The cat's, of course, on antibiotics and pain meds during this time as well. And an e-collar because before the cat was brought to me, the cat kept picking at it. So have a little cone of shame on this poor kitty um, so that he doesn't take the, the bandage off. Um, so once I finish that up, it's about one o'clock. So I'm in one hour into my lunch break. Uh, so I send my, te my technician out for lunch. Um, and I sit down to make some phone calls. I call all of the owners of the um, drop-off appointments that I've, I've done today, let them know what's going on with their animal, let them know what the treatment plan is, and let them know that they're ready to be picked up. Um, then by the time I finish that, I have 10 minutes. Um, so I go up and snuggle one of my office cats for 10 minutes before I have to start my afternoon appointments. And I scarf down some food in that time as well. Um, so then I, I go to my afternoon appointments. Thankfully, my afternoon appointments are nice and easy. Um, I have a four-week-old stray kitten, you know, allergies, a limping dog, um, you know, nothing, nothing too crazy. So I made it through the day. Um, so, you know, that was a pretty regular day for me. Not, not saying I do a euthanasia every day, but it's not uncommon at all that that happens. Um, again, no, I don't love performing euthanasias, but I know that the reason that I'm doing it is to end suffering. And that's why I do this job is I want, I advocate for the animal. And that is what I'm here for is to make sure that these animals are feeling well and have no pain. 
So, um, oh, forgot to say <laughs> my afternoon, I had to bring the cat back out with the broken leg to put the splint back on. Um, because she'd been with me all afternoon, by the time I got to her to put the splint back on, she was very upset. I've never had to sedate her before. Um, she's always been very, very good. Um, but unfortunately, she put her nails into my technician's arm three times before we all said, okay, this isn't going to work. Um, so I had to put her up, had to call mom, get permission to sedate her, and then I had to sedate her to put her bandage back on. Only took a couple of minutes, or her splint. Only took a couple of minutes, but unfortunately had to sedate her just because she's angry. So the lesson is with cats, you got to do them quickly. You can't let them stew all day. They do not like being in the hospital. Dogs don't really seem to care. They could be there all day and they're just having a good time. But cats, um, number one fear in cats is a change in environment. So being in the hospital, they're already terrified out of their mind. So when they get upset with us, it's not their fault. We can't be mad at them. We just have to understand that everything's happening because they're scared. A dog's number one fear is a loud noise. So they don't care that they're at the vet. They're actually happy. They're loving it. There's so many other dogs and smells to happen. So they're living their best lives. Um, I would say how practice has changed since COVID. Um, I'm definitely busier. I would say before COVID, um, there would be a few days every now and then that I would have a few hours without appointments and it would be great. I could get some notes done that I was behind on, call people, you know, call owners with blood work, you know, lab results, things like that. Um, in the last couple of months, I can only think of one day that has had a couple hour break. Every other day is go, 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 go. You can't turn around without having this receptionist saying, hey, I've got so-and-so on the phone. And they were wondering um, if they could come in today. And I'm like, uh, and they're like, but you don't have any time on your schedule. So I have to go to my computer, look at my schedule and say, okay, see if you can fit them in right here. Um, you know, so I don't want, um, you know, I never want an animal to have to wait for veterinary care, um, you know, especially if they're in pain. You know, so if it's something, you know, like, oh, they're itchy skin. Okay, well, they can wait until tomorrow, you know, try some Benadryl tonight and, and I'll see you tomorrow. Um, but, oh, I'm vomiting or, oh, I, I fell out in the yard and I'm limping. Like, I, I want to see you right away if I can get you in as long as I'm not compromising the care of all of my patients. Um, so that's one thing that I'm very proud of with, with my practice is that we're very, very good at getting people in same day or the next day. Um, I'll have a lot of um, People call me and say that they're vet, that they're a regular veterinarian can't see them for a few weeks, and I'm like I can get you in same day, um, and you know that's that's something that you know my clients really really love. Um, we also during COVID have been offering curbside service, so you can pull up to the parking lot, you can give us a phone call and say hey I'm here with Fluffy for her wellness exam, and a technician will come out to you, grab Fluffy from you, bring Fluffy inside. We'll do everything that we need to do for Fluffy. And the technician will bring Fluffy back outside and I will either give you a phone call or come outside to talk to you depending on your preference or depending on what's going on. If there's something really wrong with your baby, I might come outside to speak with you. Um, we do offer people to come in the, in the hospital as well, but only one person per exam room. Um, there are a lot of hospitals across the country that are not accepting anyone in the hospital whatsoever. Um, it's not, it's, it's not my choice, you know, the, the way that we're, we're running things, but I, I do think that my clients really appreciate it because they do want this. And, um, you know, it can be scary for them and their pets to be alone, you know, at the vet. So my clients really do appreciate that we do let them into that, the hospital. They do have to wear a mask. Um, and I try to stand, you know, as far away from them as possible um, while I'm speaking with them. Um, but I'm seeing a lot, a lot of animals. And I think the reason being is really just that, you know, everybody's at home, everybody's spending more time at home and they're just kind of noticing things that they may not have noticed before. And then of course I am right now seeing more puppies and kittens than I normally would um, because everybody's has been going out and adopting babies, you know, to, to keep them company during this pandemic. Um, so it's been very, very busy. Um, but it's still been very enjoyable. I'm still like loving my job. Um, it, it's still great. Um, there are a couple things, again, this might be just a little difficult for the eight-year-old. There are a couple things I want you guys to know about veterinary medicine that I didn't know before I went into the profession. Um, most of my clients are amazing. I mean, 99% of them are wonderful, wonderful people. They love their animals. They do everything that they can absolutely afford to do. 
everything that I tell them to do, they're wonderful people. You know, I have clients who will bring cakes and donuts and gifts and send cards in the mail from their babies, you know, saying, thank you, Dr. Callahan for, you know, a, a wonderful appointment, things like that. But there are people that don't respect veterinarians and don't understand, you know, everything that we do. Um, and of course I have to charge for my services. I have to charge for my time, my expertise, the medication that I use, I have to pay my staff, I have to keep the lights on in the building. And unfortunately it gets expensive. And if you, you know, compare it to human medicine, yes, it's much less expensive because you have insurance for yourself, but more likely than not, not for your pet. Um, pet insurance is wonderful. I recommend it absolutely for all of my puppies and kittens. It's great. Um, but unfortunately, there are people that just don't understand that, that I can't take payments later. Um, so I'll have multiple clients, you know, or not clients or new, new clients will say, well, yes, my cat is really sick or my dog is really sick. And I know that, you know, you need to do a lot of things, but can I pay you next month? Unfortunately, no, I need payment at time of service. I mean, what I would love to say to these people is, do you go to the grocery store, put your card up there, they ring you up, okay, that'll be $150. And you say, okay, well, I only have $20 today. Can I pay you the rest next month? They're gonna say, no, you can take $20 worth of groceries and you can put the rest back. Um, you know, so unfortunately that is one negative part of my job that I do have to charge for what I do. If I could do everything for free, I would. Um, a lot of people think we're in it for the money. It does not matter if I do a toenail trim versus IV catheter, x-rays, blood work, blah, 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 I'm still gonna walk out with the same paycheck every day. It doesn't matter. I'm still gonna give your pet the same care no matter what. So it, I, I'm not money hungry. I'm still gonna walk out with the same paycheck. I'm still pretty broke, you know, um, just because, you know, I ask you for that money doesn't mean it's going into my pocket. Um, but again, most of my clients completely understand. They're wonderful. Um, also, as a veterinarian, I'm, I'm not just needed for my medical training. You know, sometimes, you know, people need me as a counselor. You know, I have clients that they just need someone to talk to. You know, I'm an educator. I have to, you know, teach people, you know, how to take care of their animals and what's needed throughout their lives and things like that. I sometimes have to be a financial advisor and, you know, say, okay, well, what can we afford today? What's the budget? How can we work this out to get you as best care as we can get you? I have to be a team leader. I am a role model for my entire staff. You know, they all look up to me, you know, so if I'm having a bad day, they all notice that. So I have to, you know, work really hard to, you know, keep my upbeat personality, um, you know, and I'm the face of my business, um, you know, so if I'm out in town and I, if I have clients that come up to me all the time, they're like, Dr. Callahan, oh my gosh, you know, in the grocery store and things like that, you know, I, I need to present myself in a way that um, gives my business good publicity and that is not a hindrance to my business. Um, there's one other thing that um, I, one other point that I wanna make and probably not good for the eight-year-old to hear this one, um, but veterinary medicine has the second highest suicide rate of any profession, um, second to uh, police officers. Um, and unfortunately, uh, about 75% of those um, veterinarians that are committing suicide are small animal veterinarians, meaning that they practice with dogs and cats, and most of them being within their first five years of practice. That being so, because of compassion fatigue, um, you know, burnout, because we're just overworked, um, because, our, because people don't appreciate our time and our expertise, and, you know, they berate us because we had to charge them money, you know, to to fix something. Um, so unfortunately, you know, I, I just want people to, if you take one thing out of this lecture today, if you don't want to be a veterinarian, that's fine. If you do, wonderful. It's a wonderful career. I don't want to talk people out of it. I love it very, very much. But if you take one thing out of this um, talk today is just be kind to your veterinarian. You know, we're struggling too. We're broke. We're tired. You know, we, we, um, we would love to be, you know, at home with our animals sitting at home and, and working from home from this pandemic, but we can't. We're here to take care of your animals. And that's why we do this. We do it because we love the animals and that's it. We don't do it to get a nice big paycheck. If we were in it for the paycheck, we'd be human doctors. Um, but we do it because we truly do love your animals. Um, I don't really want to end it on a bad note though. Um, so I'll just tell you um, about my five sweet cats. Um, my first uh, baby. So I didn't get any of my own pets until my clinical year 
of vet school. Um, and I was not a cat person. I was strictly a dog person. Um, actually, when I was a tech, I would um, find any other technician for a cat appointment, see if anybody else would take it because I didn't want to. Um, and my best friend in vet school um, was on a rotation and she, um, somebody brought in a two week old cat. And so she brought it home and was like, hey, I'm gonna foster this cat, but I can't keep it because my boyfriend back home is allergic. And I was like, well, I'm not keeping this cat. I'm sorry. Um, so she was like, yeah, no, it's fine. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of it. And then she had, um, her emergency rotation, which is an overnight rotation. So I offered to take the cat and, you know, she needed, you know, feedings every couple of hours. So I'm, I'm awake with her at 2am and 4am, you know, doing that. And eventually I fall in love with her. So I, I adopted her. I named her Riesling, uh, my favorite wine. And then, um, about a couple, about a month or no, probably three months later, um, another cat came into the hospital, um, name um that had an injury to the front left leg and i adopted her and named her merlot they looked like um they looked very identical um and also riesling had developed some some issues she um had um basically one day she just stopped using her front left leg and then two days later she stopped using her back left leg and she took some x-rays and we basically found out she doesn't have a shoulder joint. It's just some bones there, but no like ball and socket. And the knee is just all messed up. And um, thankfully we did some acupuncture. Um, I was at LSU teaching hospital, thankfully. So um, we went to the acupuncture um, do doctor and he did eight sessions on her. You know, I mean, she's like, you know, this big, you know, sitting in his palm uh, asleep while he's doing acupuncture on her. Um, and thankfully after that, she was able to walk. She still has some problems, um, but she does really well. So, and then my third cat came in with some injuries to the feet at my um, the hospital I work at now, um, was abandoned. Um, and so after six months of him being obsessed with me, every time I walked by the cat room, I decided, please come home with me. Um, so I don't know a great way to show you all of my cats right now. Um, this is Pharaoh. This is the my third kitty. Um, I have a lot of cats. This is Riesling. This is my first one. This is my, my baby girl. And um, this is Merlot. This is my middle child. Um, I, unfortunately, I actually like don't have any pictures of um, Mama, which is one of Kyle's cats because she is a big hider. She likes to hide a lot. So um, I never have my camera with me when she actually comes out. But this is Blue. Uh, this was him last night actually um, on our cat tree. <laughs> Um, so that's pretty much um, all I have to say. So I'm going to look at your questions. Um, let's see. What is my favorite animal? So my favorite animal, just in animals in general, is definitely um, primates, if I had to be very broad about it. My favorite pri primate would be the baboon, of course, because I've worked with them. Um, but other than that, the golden lion tamarind um, is my favorite. Um, they're little tiny little monkeys um, from South America, and I like that a lot. Um, cats absolutely are allergic to, to lots of things. They can be allergic to um, most, most allergies in dogs and cats are environmental allergies, just like you and me. They can be allergic to pollen, you know, ragweed, dander, grass, you know, mites, all the things, all the trees. Um, they can also be allergic to um, the protein source in their food. Um, if they're allergic to their food, that's most likely what it is, is the protein source. Chicken's number one, um, me, um, beef is number two, and then fish is number three. Um, grain and things like that is actually very, very, very rare um, that animals are allergic to that. Um, let's see. What is acupuncture? That's a great question. Um, acupuncture is a actually a Chinese... Um, St uh, study of medicine. It's a very ancient uh, medicine. So basically there are all these points all along your body and along your entire body um, that if you stick a needle in this, and it's a very, very, very tiny needle. So it, it really doesn't hurt. Um, if you stick a needle in like this point, then it's going to affect your liver and it's going to cause your liver to open up and to, you know, make cells that it needs to make and to help healing in your liver. Um, and then, you know, there's a pressure point on the, uh, on an animal called GV twenty. So I don't, I am not an acupuncturist. I don't know all the pressure. Point. I don't know all the points, but there is a uh, pressure point called GV 26. It's at the top of the head. It's usually the, one of the first ones they do in animals to start an acupuncture session that helps with calming. 
So it's the first one they do, the animal relaxes, and then they can put their um, needles where they need to, it's specific for that animal. So Riesling, for example, she had um, needles around her shoulder and her knee, which is the places that were bothering her. And then of course, you know, she had the one in her head to help calm her down, and then she would sleep through her acupuncture session. Um, there's different things you can do with acupuncture as well, but that's the basics of acupuncture. Um, <laughs> um, I just have cats. Um, I grew up with um, two dogs, um, two Karen Terriers, Buddy and Ginger. Um, Buddy lived to be 16 years old. He unfortunately passed away just a month before um, I came back to the States to finish um, my veterinary um, education. Um, he was my dog. He was my wonderful man. Um, my grumpy old man is what I called him. Um, <laughs> if he was sleeping, don't wake him up. He will, he will bite you. <laughs> um, but he would follow me everywhere. I loved him very much. And Ginger um, was his younger sister, not, not actually related. Um, she got diabetes um, and had cataracts in her eyes, but she lived to be about um, 14. Um, but pancreatitis is eventually what ended her life. Um, but now I just have cats. Um, cats work much better for my lifestyle right now, um, where you know I'm at work all day. You know, that if I was at work all day, you know my you know my dogs would need to go out to the bathroom and things like that. Thankfully, my cats can take care of themselves, <laughs> so it works better for me right now. Um, working in Africa is very different than working um, with small animals in America. Um, mainly because where I was, I was um, at a rehabilitation facility. So we're in the middle of the African bush. We're, we were an hour away from any, from any town or civilization. Um, so, you know, we do, a, a, we do the best we can. The other thing was that we got no money from the government. Everything was uh, um, on a volunteer um, donation basis. So it was very difficult to procure medications and things that we needed. We had to be very, you know, stingy on how we used things. Um, but, you know, we, we did what we could, you know, um, and we, I think we actually took as, as great a care as we put, could have possibly taken in the middle of the African bush of these animals. Um, let's see. What makes application to vet school stand out? Um, experience. Experience, experience, experience is really, really important. They're kind of getting away from the grades. Like, you don't need that 4.0 anymore. I certainly didn't have a 4.0. Um, I'm not, you know, I didn't have a, you know, a 2.5 or anything like that. But, um, but, and once I realized I wanted to get into vet school, you know, I, I was like, a, before that, I was like a, a B student. And once I realized I wanted to get vet school, I took all the biology classes. I got A's in all of those classes because I, you know, I, I proved myself. I wanted to show myself. So I think that helps, but experience is so important. So as early as you can, just get out there and volunteer with all different species, all different places. It's great to uh, volunteer with multiple different, um, not only species, but even just different practices because not every practice is run the same. Every practice is run differently. So it gets you a good feel of, of the whole practice of veterinary medicine and to really get you a good idea if this is something you know that would be good for you. Um, the cost of veterinary school is going to be very different depending on where you go. Um, so if you are lucky enough that there is a um, veterinary school within your state, then you will pay in-state tuition and it will be significantly less expensive than if you go to an out-of-state school or if you go to like Ross University. Um, so I think the average debt for Ross University was about three to $400,000. Um, it's very, very expensive. Um, again, you know, we, we all knew that we're paying more to, to go there. Um, you know, it's a little bit easier to get into Ross as well um, than it is a state school. Um, but I would say for sure experience is, is the best thing that you can have on your um, resume. Have I ever worked with a pony? Actually, yes. Well, I've worked with donkeys. So in um, my uh, time at Ross, in our final semester, um, we have a surgical um, rotation and we are given a donkey and a sheep and we have to take care of them for the semester and perform surgeries on them. So my donkey's name was Paul. Um, he was a very good donkey. He really liked berry berry kicks um, as a snack um, and we performed um, a surgery on a castration on him. We performed a um, surgery to basically it was just like um, to just look at the nerves on his leg and kind of suture everything back up. Um, and we performed um, one other procedure. I honestly don't remember. It's been a while. Um, I've been a vet for three years now. Um, absolutely loving it. I learn new things every single day, 
every day is challenging. Every day is different. Always keeps me on my toes. Um, I love, you know, getting to experience all of the um, patients that I see, getting to watch them grow up and to make, um, you know, lasting relationships with the clients that I have. Um, what was my undergraduate degree at USC after switching from exercise science? I actually stayed with exercise science. So I actually did graduate with the exercise science degree, but I just added a bunch of different biology classes that were the prerequisites for um, veterinary school. So for example, I took veterinary nutrition. I was actually very lucky when I took it, it was the first time that they had offered that class in 11 years, I was told. Um, so I just, the heavens opened up for me. God said, you need to go to vet school. This is you. Um, I took that class. I took a bunch of different biology classes. I took organic chemistry, you know, all of the terrible things you have to do. Um, so you don't have to have any specific degree to be a veteran, to go to veterinary school. You just have to have the requisites that the schools require. And you, I mean, you can be an accountant and go to veterinary school as long as you have those prerequisite classes done. Um, what do you suggest to high school students who are wanting to go into this field? Um, volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Experience is your best thing. Um, because not only is it going to show you yes or no, this is something that you do truly want to do, um, but it's also going to help you in applying for veterinary school to give you all that experience to help you stand out. Um, again, I recommend working with multiple different species to give you a feel of and help you to figure out what you might be interested in um, going into to practice with. Um, and then again, working at multiple different practices. You know, if, if you're adamant that you are only going to be small animal, well, great, that's fine. But work at a couple different places, volunteer at a couple different places so you can really get the feel of how a small animal clinic functions. Um, oh, Kylie is actually six, not eight. That's even better, Kylie. I hope you enjoyed this talk and I hope that um, you do want to be a veterinarian one day. I think you'll be a great doctor. Um, it's a really, really fun job. Um, let's see, would you recommend getting a dog if you live in an apartment and don't have a yard? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with getting a dog in an apartment. I would probably recommend a smaller breed dog than a larger breed dog. Um, only because, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier. They don't take up as much space and, and apartments are usually smaller as well. Um, so like, I, I wouldn't recommend like a German Shepherd for an apartment, um, just because they're just not going to have enough room and they need more exercise. So like, you know, um, a Pomeranian, a Chihuahua, a Beagle, you know, those would be great for apartment living. Those are lazy dogs anyway. They don't require a lot of exercise, but those dogs that are high energy that need a lot of exercise, mm, I really probably would recommend against that in an apartment living situation. Um, let's see what else. You have three cats. That's great. Cats are the best. Um, my daughter started seventh grade and wants to be a veterinarian. What courses should she focus on in middle school and high school? Um, I would just say your science classes are your best bets. Um, so your biologies, your anatomies, definitely take anatomy in high school, even though it's going to be human anatomy. There's a lot, all the bones are basically the same. A lot of the muscles are basically the same. So it's really going to help you and give you a little bit of a leg up when you're learning the names of all of these bones and, and, and the animals. Um, other than that, I mean, I don't think there's anything really specific that, that you would have to do. But again, in high school, definitely start volunteering. Um, Da dachshund named Bo, cute. Can you explain how you found which vet school to go to? Isn't it really hard to get into vet school due to there not being one in every state? Absolutely, it is very difficult into vet to get into vet school. I will tell you that when I, you know, was in the process of you know thinking that's what I wanted to do and was telling people I think I want to go to vet school, I can't tell you the number of adults that told me you'll never get in. Um, you know, I had one of my doc, like a doctor that I went to, you know, was like, oh my uh, my son's. Um, wife, you know, she had a 4.0 and she couldn't get into vet school. So I just don't think you'll be able to. And please don't ever let anybody tell you that because there is absolutely a way to get into vet school. Um, yes. So there is, um, there are resources out there that break down every veterinary school, their requirements, um, you know, um, how much they cost, all of these things, what, you know, what they're famous for, you know, oh, like this school is best if you're really interested in large animals, this school is best if you're interested in exotics you know, things like that. So there is, um, I had a, a, a book, actually like a paper copy book when I was applying. Um, you could probably find it on Amazon or you could even just Google like um, difference between vet schools or something like that. And you could probably find that information. Um, but I, I didn't even know about Ross University. It wasn't in the, the book that I found, but somebody just mentioned it to me. 
And they were like, oh yeah, it's in the Caribbean. I was like, what? That sounds cool. And they, and they, they mentioned it was easier to get in. So I added that to my, my group of, of uh, schools that I applied to. And um, I did a in, uh, Skype interview with them. And the, the lady told me that they had monkeys on the island. And I said, I'm sold. Please just tell me I'm in and I'm coming. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it is, I will say it is hard to get into vet school. If you apply and you don't get in the first time, do not be discouraged. Just keep applying. You will eventually get in just while you're waiting. Just keep um, updating your resume. Keep, keep volunteering. Keep getting new experiences to help you with that. Um, did your exercise science degree come in handy during your time at veterinary school? Um, I would say I took a lot of anatomy classes for that degree, so that helped. It gave me a little bit of a leg up. Um, I'm also very interested in, you know, sports medicine and things like that as well. So, you know, it helps me with, you know, injuries for animals. Um, I'm, I'm able to maybe, you know, see an injury more so than, you know, maybe a lay person would see. And I'm very interested in rehabilitation with animals and things like that. So I'm able to, you know, kind of say like, here's some exercises you could do at home for your dog to help these joints and to help this injury to maybe get better, you know, so that helped me. But other than that, probably not so much. <laughs> um, what is one of the most interesting cases you've ever dealt with? Are there really rare diagnoses you've made? Actually, okay, really rare diagnosis I made was just um, about a month, month or two ago. Um, I had a cat come in, um, about a 10-year-old, nine-year-old cat, so not even that old. Um, and it, it came in for, for something I honestly don't remember. Just I think it was just being a little lethargic, just hadn't been quite acting quite right. I do my exam and I'm feeling the abdomen and I'm like, ooh, kind of feels like there's fluid in there. So I was like, let me go just take an x-ray of her and let, and let me see what's going on. So I'll put her on the x-ray table and the abdomen is full of fluid. So the first thing you need to do when you have an, an abdomen full of fluid is you need to get a sample of the, of the fluid and find out what that fluid is. So stick a needle in the belly, pull some fluid out and it's milky white, okay? <laughs> it's very, very rare that you see this, okay? So we have chylosuffusion in the abdomen, okay? In cats, we usually see that in the chest due to congestive heart failure. Um, so I, having never seen this before and only, you know, having chylosuffusion be talked about a few times minusculely in vet school, um, I look in my textbook, I still don't see what I need. So I call the internist, um, the specialist and, and the specialist gets on the phone and she's like, congratulations on your first chy chylos chylothorax. And I'm like, no, 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 it's in the abdomen. And she goes, oh, really? that's insane. And I was like, if you're saying this is insane, then I know this is insane. She said, she's never even seen this before. And I was like, oh, great. So this is bad, isn't it? And she goes, yeah, it's not going to be good. So I referred, she was like, you need to refer this cat to me. And I was like, Ab absolutely, please take this cat. I, I don't, I don't want to give them bad news. So please take this cat. Um, so I sent them over there and it ended up being um, caused by lymphoma, which is cancer. And it was a high grade lymphoma, unfortunately, which is, means that it's, um, moving very quickly. Um, and so she, she, they, they didn't want to do chemo radiation, all of that, which there was still a very low prognosis for her anyway. Um, so they just elected to treat her with prednisone. Um, and I think she lived about a month after that. So that was um, one of my, my rarest diagnoses that I've made. It was, it was crazy. Um, and I felt so bad for the owners, but it was um, a good learning experience. Um, and it was a very interesting case. Um, so that was, that was definitely interesting. I'll definitely call that one of my most interesting cases. Um, yes, working at the zoo downtown is awesome. I volunteered there in undergrad. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I worked with the primates and that small mammal cave in there. Um, all of the veter uh, those, um, the people that worked there were fantastic. I had a wonderful time. I absolutely highly recommend volunteering with them. Um, let's see. How does your practice handle after hours and weekend calls? So my practice, we are open on Saturdays from eight to one. Um, it's a two doctor practice. So the other doctor and I, my, the practice owner, uh, we alternate Saturdays. Um, we are then on call um, every night. So if, I, you know, if I'm not working that day, you know, I'm not on call that night. So Dr. Griffin would be on call. Um, but, you know, we, we will take emergencies. So you give us a call after hours, you know, you say, hey, you know, fluffy, you know, broke her toenail and it's bleeding, we're happy to meet you down at the hospital and take care of it. Um, same thing with Saturdays and Sundays, you know, we're happy to meet you down there. There is um, an emergency fee that, that, you know, you have to pay for, for meeting us down there after hours, but, you know, we're happy to do it. 
Um, but after nine o'clock, um, we do not accept emergencies. We have to get sleep too. So there are two wonderful, wonderful specialty emergency rooms in our in Columbia, thankfully, um, so that they, our clients have options to that. And um, when you call us and we are asleep, the voicemail gives you the, that information. So um, thankfully, our, our clients have options pretty much at any time of day. Um, what is this? Let's see. I missed one, I think. Um, what advice would you give someone who wants to go back to veterinary school later in life? Absolutely do it. I had several people in my class at Ross that were um, not in their 20s, um, you know, so if that's what you're passionate about, absolutely. Um, you know, you're, depending on what your undergraduate career was and how long ago it was, you may or may not have to retake some classes or, or add some classes to that. Um, so as long as you're okay with doing that, um, as long as you're okay with knowing that the next four years of your life in veterinary school are going to be really, really rough. You're not going to see a lot of your family. Um, you're going to be stressed out, but you're going to get through it and then life's going to be great. Um, so yeah, if, if that's what you're passionate about, then I don't see any reason that you couldn't do that. What is the salary of a veterinarian? <laughs> um, it really depends um, on a couple of things, whether you're male or female. Unfortunately, that is the way of the world. Um, it also depends on um, whether you're working corporate or not. So I don't work corporate, so I'm not going to make as much um, as someone that works for a corporate practice, like Banfield, for example, is a corporate practice. Um, so one of my great friends from vet school is working down the road at Banfield and is making more than double what I'm making, um, which is fine. You know, I, again, I'm not in it for the money. I love my job. I'm at my job because I love the people that I work with. Um, and I don't, and I don't want to leave that. Um, so the salary, you know, starting salary, again, it depends also on the part of the country that you live in, you know, so California is going to have a higher salary just because the cost of living is so much higher. Um, so the, the, the starting salary is probably going to be somewhere between 60 to 100. And that's only because my starting salary was 60. And a good friend of mine starting salary was 100 because he was in Delaware in a very community of retired uh, veterans or something. So um, they paid them a lot of money to be there. So, um, but then, you know, you get raises and you get bonuses and things like that. So you don't, you know, you're not stuck at that number, you know, will go higher, but it doesn't get um, anywhere near what you, you would want it to be like, you know, what you would think a, a medical um, professional makes, you know, we're not in the 300, 400, 500, you know, thousand dollar ranges, unless you're a multiple practice owner, you know, things like that. Um, my dog's name was Princess. Oh, cute. Um, have you ever worked at a zoo? Yes, I, um, I worked at the, um, uh, the Columbia Zoo, volunteered there for um, about a year and a half, I believe, again, with the, um, the gorillas and the, uh, the small, am small mammal cave. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, do you ever work on animals people bring in that are not pets, like bats or rabbits? Um, no, I do not. I only do cats and dogs. Um, bats, I'm not legally allowed to treat. Um, that would be a wildlife um, issue um, and a rabies issue as well. Um, I was vaccinated for rabies during vet school, but that is something that you have to keep updated and I didn't, I haven't kept it updated. Um, I don't treat rabbits. I'm actually terrified of rabbits. Um, rabbits are very, very difficult um, in veterinary settings. Um, so, and I never had, um, I never grew up with a guinea pig or a rabbit or, or a gerbil. So I never really like um, wanted to, to work with them because I just don't understand them, you know, so I only treat dogs and cats. Um, I'm a career specialist in Lexington. We are putting together a virtual career for them. We would love to add Dr. Kelly in. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much. Um, Molly enjoyed your glad. Hey, glad for, thank you for joining us, Molly, seven years old. Um, is there a risk of bringing animal sickness to your pets at home? Yes, there absolutely is. Um, so Parvovirus, for example, is a very contagious um, disease that we see in puppies. Um, it is transmitted in their feces and their vomitus. Um, so when I have a parvo animal in the house, you know, especially if you have dogs in the house, it's not really transmissible to cats, but it's transmissible to dogs. So if I had dogs in the house, what I would have to do when I came home is come in the house, take my scrubs off immediately, put them right into the washing machine, and then get in the shower to make sure that I don't bring that disease to my, my pets. Although should be able to prevent that disease with vaccination. So 
I had dogs, they would be vaccinated and we wouldn't be dealing with that. But so there are some communicable diseases that I can actually absolutely bring home. Um, I must have brought a flea home at one time because um, one of my cats had a tapeworm. Uh, I found it on her little butt as she walked past me. I was like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, gross, that's a tapeworm. Um, so to get a tapeworm, you have to eat a flea. Um, so I must have brought a flea home for her at one point because I've never seen fleas in my house. <laughs> um, do I take care of, is that pandas? No, I wish I took care of pandas. I love pandas. They're super cute, um, but they're pretty rare. So I think the closest pandas to us are in Atlanta. So I've never taken care of pandas. Um, I just started my first year of high school this year, and I'm still a bit confused and stressed about what to do when I graduate and when, and when wanting to be a vet and also how many hours should I get of shadowing? I already have a couple of hours. I honestly, as many hours as you can possibly have. I mean, I, I, I can't remember how many hours, but I, think, I, I know I had at least, at least 500 hours when I applied to vet school that I could prove that I had done, you know? So as many hours as you can possibly have, there's no right number, um, but the more hours you have, the more you're gonna stand out. Um, and again, you know, you can do that now, you can do that while you're in, in um, undergraduate, and you can do that in between. If you want to take time off between high school and undergrad, you can do that. You can take time off between undergrad and vet school. They don't love that you do that, but you certainly can. There's no reason that you can't. I think times are changing where people, they're realizing that it's okay to do that. Um, so I think honestly, just the more hours of shadowing that you can get is best. Um, have I ever gotten bit by a dog or cat? Um, currently sporting um, a lot of injuries right now, actually, um, embarrassingly enough, from my boyfriend's cat. Um, she's very, very skittish. We haven't had her for very long, sweet mama. And um, I had to take her into the clinic for something and getting her to the carrier, she freaked out. And then at the clinic, she was fine. I cut her toenails. She said nothing. I was putting her into the carrier. It was a top opening carrier. The lid fell and closed and it slammed and she lost it. And chomped on my thumb a couple of times, um, <laughs> but it's just out of fear. It's not out of aggression or, or meanness or anger or anything like that. She was just terrified out of her mind. So um, it does happen. My technician's job is, to put, is supposed to prevent me from getting bit or scratched, um, but, it, but it absolutely does happen. Um, you have two bunnies. That's cute. Um, and I think I've reached all the questions. Um, does anybody have any last minute questions or anything? Did I, if I miss anybody's questions, go ahead and type it again really quickly for me. Um, let's see, what training do you have to have to be a tech? Um, it depends on your state, but usually you don't actually have to have any licensing. Um, you can, a lot, of, a lot of clinics will just train you from the ground up. So that's what we did for, I, we have three technicians in my practice. Um, one of them, we tr she was a kennel worker first and we trained her from there up to, to technician. And she's one of my best technicians actually. Um, so um, depending on where you work and depending on the state, there are um, two year um, uh, technician schools that you can do. Um, and that's great. Um, getting that um, licensing is great. It'll, it'll help you with, you know, salary and things like that. Um, but um, you don't technically have to have any um, professional training. Let's see. All right. Any other question? Let's see. What would be the best way to open up your own clinic? That's a great question. I think the best way would probably be to buy it from somebody else that's selling. To start it from the ground up is totally possible, but it's a lot of um, loans and things you'd have to take out to buy all of the machinery and equipment that you would need. So if you could buy a practice and it's already got all of that there, that'd be great. The other thing too, um, if you're starting from the ground up, you've got to establish a client base. Um, you know, so if you're buying over a practice, you get to take over their client base as well. You know, so sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes, you know, on the sketch a little bit, you can take some of your clients with you. Uh, they don't love it when you do that, but that is possible. Um, but the best way I, I would say is probably to buy it from somebody else um, would probably be the easier way of doing it. Let's see, how should I ask the vets I have shadowed for recommendation letters? Um, I would just say, hey, I'm applying to vet school. Is there any way that you could write me a recommendation letter? I've loved my experience with you um, and it would be really wonderful if you could do that for me. Um, I've had um, a couple of, um, of uh, college students that have um, volunteered with me and I wrote 
the first girl, I wrote her letter of recommendation. She got into Tennessee, so she's starting this fall. And then the uh, last um, one I had just actually emailed me last week and asked me if um, I would write her a letter of recommendation. I said, of course. So, um, you know, as long as you had a great experience there and, you know, you got along well with the doctor you shadowed, then I don't see that there's any reason you can't ask them for that recommendation. Um, have you ever done any dog births? We are breeding my dog soon. I actually um, have not yet. Um, it's, it's getting more rare that we, we do that because, um, you know, most people, you know, spay and neuter their dogs. So we don't see that. There is a theory of genolysis in Charleston. If you do have any questions, you can look them up. Um, but I'm not really, you know, I don't really have a wide, um, knowledge base on, um, breeding and the birth other than like, you know, like a C-section or, um, a spay type of uh, surgery. <laughs> um, any other last minute questions? Give it just another couple of seconds. Um, you guys, you know, reach out to your alumni association. They can get you in contact with me um, if you need anything. But again, um, um, but again, you know, just be kind to your veterinarian, you know, we're trying our hardest. We're here for your pets. We're here for you. Um, and I hope you guys learned something today. Um, oh, what majors are there for Carolina for vet program? Um, so there is no like pre veterinary um, major. So I would say anything on your science thing would be fine. Anything that you're interested, if you want to do biology, you can do exercise science, but again, you can do statistics, you can do accounting as long as you have those prerequisites done. It doesn't matter what your major is. Well, Dr. Callahan, thank you so much for your time. Listening to A Day in the Life, we know that it's not uh, excellent all the time, but I'm sure you get good cuddles in when you can. So I, I really like cuddles, yes. <laughs> yes, um, we appreciate your time and just to let people know that uh, requested the link to today's session, we'll definitely be able to share that. Um, it will be sent out to the email that you registered to, uh, and then that's it. We hope everybody enjoyed it, and thank you.